history of New Orleans. From that point to now, New Orleans is a city of rich culture and intriguing customs. No other city in America keeps its set of experiences as fundamental and available as New Orleans. Many more than one house, a great many roads, in fact whole areas, radiate a rich feeling of spot, and fill in as standards for captivating history and complex culture. Search for it. In New Orleans, history can swagger as noisily as a carnival strolling crewe, or creep as delicately as a green reptile on a yard divider. Exciting. Bright. Lamentable. Rousing. Find a little about the breadth of the city's set of experiences. Frontier New Orleans. Native individuals called it Balbanca, place where there is numerous tongues, and they possess the rich delta lands between the Mississippi River, Father of Waters, and Aqua Tar, Big Water, Lake Pontchartrain, for the very reasons that would later pull in Europeans, bountiful natural assets and a helpful organization of safe waterways, narrows and straits. Asserted for the French crown by pilgrim Robert Cavelier, Sieur de La Salle in 1682, La Nouvelle Orleans was established by Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne de Bienville in 1718 upon the marginally raised banks of the Mississippi River roughly 95 miles over its mouth. Designers spread out a framework of roads with a place arm, the present Jackson Square, that would get known as the Vieux Carré, Old Square, or the present French Quarter. The early station turned into the capital of the French colony of Louisiana in 1723. That very year, France surrendered Louisiana to Spain, to keep it out of the hands of the British, victors of the new French and Indian War. For the rest of the 1700s, Louisiana was a Spanish settlement, and Nueva Orleans worked as a significant exchanging and social cooperate with Cuba, Mexico, and past. It was during the Spanish frontier time that New Orleans changed from a town-like climate of wooden houses to a city of sturdier block structures with metropolitan framework, generally because of the neglected work of subjugated individuals. Catalyzing the change were two awful flames, in 1788 and 1794, which together obliterated over 1,000 old French structures. New compositional codes were presented presently, bringing about awe-inspiring Spanish colonial-style structures, for example, the Cabaldo fronting the present Jackson Square. Other Spanish commitments incorporate fashioned iron galleries, porches, patios, over-the-ground graveyards, and the city's most punctual development, the suburbio Santa Maria, the present central business district. The Spanish likewise changed strategies administering subjugation, which empowered the sensational development of a station of free minorities. In 1800, the Spanish retroceded Louisiana back to France, just to have Napoleon sell the whole Louisiana province, including New Orleans, to the United States as a feature of the $15 million Louisiana Purchase, settled on December 20, 1803. Albeit not, at this point a French state, inhabitants in the new American city of New Orleans held tight to their Francophile ways, including language, religion, customs, a mind-boggling social layers, and a propensity for the luxurious. The Creoles, that is, the privately conceived relatives of early occupants, numerous with French blood, made a refined and cosmopolitan culture that stood separated from virtually every other American city. From the roads of the French Quarter, to the Creole cabins of the Faubourg Marigny, to the old Ursuline convent and the previous charity hospital, remnants of French pioneer times endure right up, till today. Plagued by pirates and privateers. The progression of products between the Gulf of Mexico and Port of New Orleans pulled in dealers, privateers, and privateers, with Jean Lafitte and his sibling Pierre among the most scandalous. Jean Lafitte was a fixer and rebel who assumed an instrumental part in supporting Marge, General Andrew Jackson and the Americans in their triumph over the British during the Battle of New Orleans, 1815, it shall met. Custom holds that Lafitte's blacksmith shop, at 941 Bourbon Street, filled in as the privateer's base. Presumably dating to the 1770s and said to be the most seasoned design lodging a bar in the United States, Lafitte's blacksmith shop is a pleasant relic of frontier time vernacular engineering, and still a famous cantina today. Mardi Gras. 
Mardi Gras was first recorded in the present-day United States in March 1699, as Iberville and Bienville cruised up the Mississippi River and made note of the midwinter feast in their diary as they stayed outdoors at Point du Mardi Gras. From that point onward, French pilgrims observed Mardi Gras in Mobile and, following its establishing in 1718, in New Orleans, generally as open party and private costumed balls. Mardi Gras stayed a boisterous yet for the most part casual issue until 1857, when a gathering of Anglo-Americans from Mobile shaped the mystic Crewe of Comus and presented formal processions and expand drifts coordinated by friendly associations called crews. The crews of Comus and later Rex would set the layout for Mardi Gras for quite a long time to come, by which time New Orleanians gladly called their pre-Lenten banquet the best free show on earth pre-war New Orleans. During the 1800s, the most elevated grouping of tycoons in America could be found between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Their abundance came generally from sugar-stick manners, which relied upon the work of thousands of oppressed African Americans. During the 1850s alone, Louisiana ranchers delivered an expected 450 million pounds of sugar each year, worth more than $20 million every year. Sugar and cotton came downriver on steamers in transit to worldwide business sectors. A large number of dock workers worked on the wharves of New Orleans to move the freight to maritime boats subsequent to emptying their imports, while many financiers, traders, elements, guarantors, and legal advisors oversaw money and coordinations. Millions were made in the business, and a lot of it went to the amazing gentry. That abundance might be seen right up, till today in the rich condos of the French Quarter and the brilliant houses of the Garden District. In any case, that class couldn't veil the way that this was an oppressed society, just as the country's busiest slave commercial center, all through the prior to the war period, 1803 to 1861. In 1840, New Orleans positioned as the third biggest city in the country, the biggest in the South, and the fourth busiest port on the planet. It had a populace of 102,193, of whom 58% were white, 23% were oppressed African Americans, and 19% were free ethnic minorities. Its two essential nationalities, French-speaking Creoles and English-speaking Anglo-Americans went after power and lived in to a great extent separate areas, the Creoles in the French Quarter and the Lower Faubourgs, the Anglo-Americans in what is presently the Central Business District, Lower Garden District, and Garden District. All areas involved the restricted bow-molded regular levee adjoining the Mississippi River, behind which was a dreadful bog. Stream floods, typhoons, and flames were steady dangers, as were wrecking scourges of yellow fever, dengue, intestinal sickness and cholera. The Civil War and Reconstruction Association troops caught Confederate New Orleans in May 1862 and involved the district for the rest of the Civil War. A short time later, a racially coordinated Reconstruction time government passed a reformist state constitution and looked to set up social equality for liberated slaves. However, after the finish of Reconstruction in 1877, racial oppressor powers consistently recovered control, and racial enslavement and isolation would follow for a century to come. The 1896 Supreme Court choice on Plessy v. Ferguson, which legitimately authorized, separate however equivalent, arrangements, gotten from a nearby case. While New Orleans could never recapture its mastery of Western exchange, the Crescent City in postbellum times made up for lost time with railroad development, port modernization, levee building, and metropolitan upgrades. The city made strong infrastructural headways during the progressive era in metropolitan waste, water treatment, sewerage, sterilization, general well-being, and metropolitan beautification. Local people additionally spearheaded the conservation development, beginning with the French Quarter, even as auto-accommodating areas were spread out in as of late depleted swamplands, and the metropolitan impression of the modernizing city came to the shores of Lake Pontchartrain. Victorian New Orleans and the dawn of jazz. You can in any case hear it and smell it, the stir of skirts across heart of pine floors, a ragtime tune tinkling from an open treme window, a whiff of cheroot smoke, frosted clams and ale lager from a magazine street cantina. 
Find Victoria and New Orleans, the last part of the 1800s, when the city acquired footing, when expressions and execution prospered, and when lavish gingerbread embellished houses went up in large numbers. The Fairgrounds, 1872, Audubon Park, 1886, New Orleans Museum of Art, 1911, and numerous other of the city's incredible contributions appeared in this period. The late Victorian period additionally saw the development of jazz, a progressive new melodic figure of speech that would turn out to be New Orleans' most noteworthy social commitment to the country and world. Music has consistently been an inheritance in New Orleans. Even before jazz, different ethnic and racial gatherings, French, Spanish, African, Italian, Latin, German, Anglo, Irish, discovered shared conviction in making music, and right up till the present time, the city makes outsized commitments in different melodic classes, including rap, hip jump, ricochet, and funk. The jazz age in New Orleans likewise saw the ascent of an abstract and imaginative local area. The French Quarter Renaissance included figures, for example, essayists William Faulkner and Sherwood Anderson, craftsmen Ellsworth Woodward and Caroline Wogan Duryu, and celebrated dramatist Tennessee Williams, who took motivation from the rattle-trap trolley that ran down Bourbon End. The Second Great War. New Orleans assumed a basic part in the epic battle of World War II. Nearby shipbuilder Andrew Higgins, who had planned unique vessels to explore shallow Louisiana inlets, acknowledged they would serve to well to convey warriors and materiel onto shallow sea shores while staying away from profound water harbors in faux hands. Implicit neighborhood shipyards by a racially coordinated labor force of people, Higgins boats were utilized on the seashores of Normandy on D-Day and all through the island jumping effort in the Pacific. They were effective to such an extent that General Dwight D. Eisenhower would depict Higgins as the one who won the battle for us. The tale of New Orleans' gallant job in the conflict is highlighted in New Orleans' elite National World War II Museum. A continuum of progress checks New Orleans' post-World War II experience. New extensions and parkways were worked to get to extending rural areas, another regional government complex opened in Midtown, and present-day high-rises broke the cities in the past unassuming horizon. During the 1960s, the civil rights development carried pride and new freedoms to black New Orleanians. Yet, as somewhere else, protection from school combination, white flight, and a diminished expense base left some downtown areas ruined and stripped. The oil bust of the mid-1980s, concurring with the automation of port movement and the decay of well-paying transportation occupations, prompted a provincial recessional and populous mass migration. By the last part of the 1990s, be that as it may, an undeniably hearty the travel industry area and a more enhanced economy alleviated the misfortunes, however they missed the mark concerning returning the city to its previous financial position. Storm Katrina on August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina landed east of New Orleans, driving a tempest flood into artificial waterways and penetrating government levees and flood walls in various areas. The vast majority of the urbanized East Bank overwhelmed, a huge number of individuals were caught in the storm for quite a long time, and more than 1,500 individuals would at last die. Numerous evacuees stayed away forever, and a few areas, especially the Lower Ninth Ward, suffer today with altogether diminished populaces. While recuperation demonstrated sluggish and disagreeable from the outset, sheer coarseness got most New Orleanians through the emergency and yielded something of a renaissance of common soul and social pride. A feature of the post-Katrina time went ahead February 7, 2010, when the city's dearest New Orleans Saints won the group's first since forever Super Bowl. Cheers were heard, round the world, and the supported restoration of soul pulled in accomplished youngsters to be important for this epic story, changing the Crescent City by and by. New Orleans stays a city of rich culture, glad individuals, and memorable neighborhoods that have endured and flourished against chances. New Orleanians have consistently held tight to their novel culture, radiating pride of spot and savoring music, food, and celebration. Travelers from around the world can't remain away. We're happy you're here as we leave on our fourth century since Bienville started this intense analysis on the banks of the Mississippi, more than 300 years prior.
If you enjoyed this video be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Life is Often if you haven't already click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content.